Hello semanticists, Chris Potts here. This is the first screencast in our series on semantic composition. Our goal is to build and explore a simple but powerful compositional grammar for a tiny fragment of English. We dipped a toe in these waters when we talked about adjectives and semantic composition. All of that will carry over. Those ideas will now be embedded in our larger grammar. For this screencast, I want to do just two things. I want to set the stage a bit and give you a sense for where we're headed. And there's one technical preliminary I want to discuss, which is our notation for using and describing functions. Let's begin with the general overview. I've packed our entire grammar, the lexicon, and the rules of composition into this one big handout. And this handout will be the primary material for all these screencasts and for the entire unit. The theory I'll describe is bare bones in that it's just a tiny fragment of standard English with a few idealizations to keep things simple. And we'll be thinking mainly about the core truth conditions in a very small little possible world. Still, despite these limitations, this is a big step forward for us. And I think that once you get a feel for the grammar, you'll find it's easy to generalize the ideas to new constructions and new phenomena. And we'll in fact do that as part of the assigned work for the course. And that too should help you to appreciate the generality of these ideas. I want to emphasize that the theory is guaranteed compositional, even by the strictest interpretation of that principle. I'm not messing around here. I'm sticking very close to the spirit and the letter of the vision that Partee laid out for us in the first reading for the course. In doing this, I'd say the big conceptual move we need to make is to interpret lexical items as sets and functions. This is a pretty abstract idea, but I'll try to connect it with computation. And I hope that helps you see that this could be the basis for, say, a computational theory of the mind in the mode of our Jackendoff reading. And it's, of course, also very clearly aligned with Partee's approach. In particular, we're following Lewis's advice here. I wouldn't go so far as to say that meanings are sets and functions, but I do think that sets and functions do what meanings do, especially if we think of the functions as computing the meanings of words, phrases, and sentences. In terms of the details, the grammar I propose here has separate rules for the individual parts of the syntactic structures of our fragment. Since those structures are diverse, we end up with about eight rules. However, the semantic principles for interpreting those structures are much fewer in number, and they're very general. We sort of use the same semantic machinery again and again. So the idea here is that if you know the lexical meanings of your language, and you can put them together according to the syntactic rules, then you're almost all set in terms of using the language. The only other concepts you need to be a full-fledged interpreter are a few simple semantic composition rules. Now, of course, I'm sure natural languages are not this simple, but I do like this general perspective where we place most of the semantic complexity in the lexical meanings to the point where they're almost all on their own determining how things combine with each other compositionally. And then a few general principles actually put those meanings together. Finally, one more overview note, the grammar I present in this handout is implemented in the very simple Python code given at this link here. The Python script includes a little demo where we use the grammar to interpret some syntactic structures. And that demo actually includes all the examples in this handout, plus some more that seem somewhat interesting. As a group, we probably won't talk too much about the Python version in class since we're not presupposing that you know any Python. But I still think this is potentially a nice resource for all of us. The code is very readable. Indeed, it looks almost exactly like the notation in this handout. And I, so I imagine you all can figure out how to fiddle with it to learn new things and even solve some of the assignment problems. Okay, that's pretty much it for the overview. A final prefatory note. This is technical material that we'll be working with, and it's being used in a context that's probably very new to you. For such things, I really like to keep in mind this nice quotation from the pioneering mathematician and computer scientist John von Neumann. Von Neumann said, In mathematics, you don't understand things, you just get used to them. It might take a while to get used to these ideas. The best way to get used to them is to do a lot of hands-on problem solving so that you're pushed to engage with all of the details. Okay, there's just one technical preliminary that I wanna cover here so that the next screencast can dive directly into the grammar. From here on out, I'll be presupposing that you're comfortable with set theory. If that stuff is new to you, do check out the materials linked from the section tab of the website. There are great tutorials there and exercises that will let you get hands-on with the material 
in a way that will quickly make you adept at working with those fundamental concepts. The one technical preliminary I want to linger over here concerns how we talk about functions. So to illustrate, let's start with a simple sort of mathematical function for determining whether an integer is odd or even. On the left here, I've got a bit of computer code that could do that. The function is called isEven, and it uses the mod operator to determine whether the incoming integer x is even or not. In the middle, I've got a different sort of notation that's kind of more explicit in a way. So on the left, we have the inputs to the function, and the arrow explains how each input is mapped to each output. This is nice and clear, but it has two disadvantages. First, it doesn't explain what the underlying concept is. You have to kind of infer what this is computing from looking at the input-output pairs. And second, relatedly, I can't actually write down all these pairs because it's an infinite set, so I sort of gestured at that with these ellipsis dots. These things make it clear that the is-even formulation at the left is better because it says directly what the computation is, and it also finitely represents a function that can operate on an infinite number of in items, setting aside, of course, practical constraints on what computers can actually do. So I like this way of describing things because I think we can think of this program as encapsulating some knowledge. So this is the kind of thing that I'll have in mind as we build our grammar. However, in the semantics literature, for historical reasons, people rarely use notation like on the left here. Rather, the general convention is to use the lambda calculus to define semantic grammars. You can think of the lambda calculus as providing another way of expressing functions. So here on the right is the lambda version of the is-even function. The lambda x here at the left edge indicates that this is a function and x is a variable, just as, a, as in the version on the left here. This function can swallow up an integer and then it tests that integer by uniformly replacing all instances of the variable x in the body of the expression with the integer that came in and then it runs the code that results. So this is doing the same work as the more explicit version on the left. One thing you have to get used to is that return isn't typically used in these functions. Rather, the return value is whatever happens when we run the code after doing our variable substitutions. So this function will return t for true if x mod 2 is 0, that is if x is even. Otherwise, it will return f for false. Okay, building on the above, we now turn to the concept of function application. This is where we actually use the functions to compute something. You've probably seen the programming notation on the left. Uh, we fed in one here, and the output of that computation was f for false. In the middle, we use the same parenthesis notation, except now it's more like a lookup. One comes in, we find it in the domain on the left, and then we get back whatever that input is associated with on the right. Lambda notation is similar. I've put the function in outer parentheses here to make it clear that the entire function takes an argument. The argument is 1, given in parentheses here on the right. That argument comes in. We change all occurrences of x in the body of the function to that value, and then we run the resulting code. So all of this boils down to a return value of f for false, as in the other examples. For the most part, uh, I think it's good to ask a computer to do these things for you, since this is a very mechanical set of operations. However, it is good to learn how to do this lambda conversion on your own. Uh, and for that, it can help to think of this as a procedure, right? Here's a little cartoon version. We start with our function. It's waiting for inputs, so to speak. And then it gets an input, in this case, the input 1. To do the computation, we need to knock off the outer lambda. It's been filled, so to speak, with the argument. And then we find all of the x variables and replace them with that argument. And then we compute that to get our output value. And that's it. We'll make extensive use of these concepts when defining our grammar. Our next step is to build the semantic lexicon. That's where most of the work lies. And after that, we define the rules of semantic composition. And then we're often running in terms of being semantic interpreters in the strictest compositional sense. In closing here, I want to issue a piece of advice that will sound unusual at first. And that advice is don't get creative. I mean that only when working with our grammar. Please be creative in your lives in general. But when working with the grammar, it will pay to be like a mechanical computer just following literal instructions in a lockstep kind of way. When people get creative, when they guess about what the answer is rather than following the rules like soulless calculating machines, they almost always end up making mistakes.
So I'll say it once more, just for these, this unit, and just when working with this grammar, don't get creative.